Greetings to you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is Mazima Kenneth once again, and I want to bless the good Lord for the wonderful opportunity that he has given unto us to continue to do this wonderful work of the ministry. I also want to appreciate all of you out there who are faithful Berenians that have taken the initiative, always cross-examining things, and you being able to discern all things as far as what is being communicated on different forums and platforms. Well, today we are doing something that is very important, and that is to do with the issue of the balance of doctrine and sanctification. The balance of doctrine and sanctification. Now, those are two important words that uh, I need us to pay close attention to. As a matter of fact, we all know that doctrine comes from a Greek word that is known as didaskalia. And didaskalia means a teaching, can also mean an instruction, can also mean that which is taught. In other words, it can mean the precepts. The other important word that I want also to pay attention to, the word sanctification simply is a word that is gotten from a Greek word that is known as hegiosmos, which is the same thing as consecration, purification, and it's the same thing that basically means actually holiness. Now, what is very common in all the apostolic episodes, my dear ones, if you know anything that is to do with the apostolic episodes, when you look at the book of Romans, the first eight chapters, they ground the believers in one important truth that is known as the indicatives. That is to do with the issue of doctrine and what was done for us and actually the emphasis of how we ought to know what was done for us by the person of Christ. But when you look at the second book, which is the book of Corinthians, it also has so many doctrinal issues that it does address and actually instructing and showing how believers are supposed to go about particular things in the church. The confusions to do with the church in Corinth, their confusions in one or the other resulted into us also learning a number of important things that you and I would be basically having questions about and the apostle by the spirit of the Lord was able to instruct them in the way they had to go about issues. Galatians is also not different. In that, if you look at Galatians, it combats the falsehood that some people call the gospel, which is not the gospel. So that is basically to mean that the central theme of the Galatian or the book of Galatian is to show us what the gospel is not. Whereas Romans shows us what the gospel is. The other one that is very important is the book of Ephesians. Ephesians has so much doctrinal aspects that it also lays out for believers to follow. If you consider uh, the first four chapters, all of them, they get into the details of showing us the doctrinal aspects and what should be considered as a believer in line with what the Lord wants us to know. And so many of these books, they always do have the first part which dwells so much on the doctrinal part and then the last phase of these books they always show the side that is known as the imperative or actually how a believer is supposed to do what is supposed to live now what is very common today in the mainstream church is that doctrine has not been considered at the same time, the issue of sanctification, the issue of holiness, the issue of consecration, the issue of practice has not also been done what? Cared about. As a matter of fact, remember one thing that the apostles communicated in Acts chapter 2 and the verse is, uh, if we may consider verses 42. This is one thing that uh, I for one I have come to discover. Putting emphasis where emphasis is due. The Bible says in Acts chapter 
42 verses 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly, steadfastly. Look at that. E, now, the one thing that is very important is the word steadfastly, which is the same Greek word that basically means to adhere to one. It's the same word that basically means to be devoted. And it is the same word that basically means to continue all the time in a particular thing. It can also mean to persevere. It can also mean not to faint in doing what is right. So it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Look at that. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now remember, the apostles here are known as the foundational apostles. In other words, we can basically say, when they are talking about the apostles here, they are talking about those appointed delegates of the Lord that actually commissioned to lay the foundation of the church as it is also well stipulated in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and the verse is 20. So the Bible says the church in the first century continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Mark that. When they talk about the doctrine, it is the same Greek word that is known as didache. They continued in the teaching of the apostles. That is why there is a teaching that I also want to recommend at this particular juncture, which we did that is to do with the importance of doctrine before fellowship. If you are not meeting or actually on a proper definition of doctrine, therefore that fellowship is all in vain and you do not have fellowship if the doctrine that you are feeding on contradicts the rest of the scriptures. That is why 424 of John says, God seeketh they that can worship him in spirit and truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them with your truth. Thy word is the truth. The doctrine sanctifies us. If the doctrine is missing in a fellowship, you have no fellowship, but you have a gathering that has no foundation because doctrine is just like the foundational garment. None of us can go out naked to our our places of work to some other places we all need to have a garment there has to be a foundational thing that shouldn't be forgotten and uh, that's why we are considering the balance of doctrine and sanctification so these are very important things the bible says they continued in the apostles doctrine and fellowship so the first thing always as far as the apostolic episodes are concerned mainly those that are to do with uh, these foundation apostles talk about paul himself they major in showing us who we used to be and what we became and after showing us who we used to be and showing us what the Lord did for us, they end by showing us not to emulate the patterns which defined us before we came in relationship, before we came in a covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, another thing that I also want to re-echo here that is so very much important and why I actually find it very interesting and very important to consider some of these particular aspects is because, first of all, in the church today, we have a particular negligence that has been in one or the other exercised onto the issue of what is commonly known as doctrine. The church does not know which kind of a doctrine that it is supposed to live by. But let me tell you, the Lord Jesus made it very clear in John 8, 31. The Bible says, Then said unto those Jews which believed unto him, If you continue in my word, in other words, if you continue in my doctrine, in my teaching, therefore the Lord says, Then you are my disciples. There is a benefit to the issue of doctrine because it is doctrine that is going to prompt the issue of sanctification. 
it is doctrine that is going to result in the proper practice. If the doctrine is false, the practice will be false. That is to mean that life imitates doctrine. Your life responds to the doctrine you are fed on. If the doctrine does not agree with the rest of the scriptures, therefore your practice is not going to be biblical. And that is also to mean that if your doctrine is not sound, therefore your practice will not be actually sound. So this is very important, my dear ones, even as we consider some of these important things. You cannot tell an individual that it is for freedom that you have been set free and then you fail to tell him that do not use your liberty in a manner that contradicts the scriptures. Now, this is one of the things that I want to lay so very much clearly and I believe by the masses of the Lord it will be something that will enable many church folks to put things together and to know how they are supposed to do what? To conduct themselves. Remember, Paul when he was writing to the Galatians, we are not under the law, very clear. For the law was given to Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. However, we are under a different law, and that is the law of Christ, and that is the law of love. And the Bible makes it very clear in Romans 13, 8, that love is the fulfillment of the law. So, how do we nullify the law? No, we uphold the law by the means of faith. So, Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 13, that for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Look at that. You have been called unto liberty. As far as the doctrinal aspect is concerned, God buildeth us in knowing our liberty we have in Christ and how we are made righteous. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse is 8. The scripture is very clear as far as that matter is concerned. It says that for by grace you have been saved, not of your works, lest any man should boast, but this is the gift of God. So the doctrine of grace is actually central on knowing that you and I were not able to merit anything of God. That is why Titus 3 verses 5 says, we were not saved because of our good works, but because, look at that, but because of what? But because of the mercies of God. Now that is very important. Those are the same thing that you'll also meet in a number of different scriptures. If we may actually also consider Philippians Philippians chapter 3 verses 9. Paul says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Very important. How are we made righteous? We are made righteous on one simple basis of faithing in the person of Christ. As a matter of fact, Galatians chapter 2 also makes it very clear. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse is 16, it makes it very clear by saying, knowing that a man is not justified by works, that is to mean salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, no addition no subtraction. So it doesn't say, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in, in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be done what? Justified. As if that is not enough. Rolling down to the book of Galatians, uh, I mean Romans, it says in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, beginning with verses 19. It says in verses 19, Know we that whatever the law says, says unto those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world might become guilty before God. Verses 8, I mean 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
people are made righteous on the basis of what? Believing unto Christ. That is why verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. It's not about to be revealed. It is already revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Look at 22. Even the righteousness of God the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who are those, every man, and on all who believe, for there is no difference. The Jews need the righteousness of God, the Gentiles also need the righteousness of what? of God. Now, the Bible also makes it so very much clear when we actually consider other important scriptures, like if we may consider Acts 13, verses 30, 38 and 39. This is what it says. It says, Therefore, let it be known unto you, brethren, that through this man is preached unto the forgiveness of sins. How do men receive the forgiveness of sins? By believing in the person of Christ, acknowledging his death, burial, and resurrection. That's one of the main things. 39. That by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The Bible talks about the main things here. There is justification and sanctification. Justification is followed by sanctification. Yes, you have been saved like this, but yes, this is how you are supposed to live. And that is one other thing that we are about also to do what to consider. Now, I want us also to consider another important truth. If we may consider Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verses uh, 4. It says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him. Yes, you were chosen. But the Bible says you are not just chosen, but you are chosen for something that is actually very, very great and very important. That we should be corporate solidarity. Chosen. We are chosen as a body of Christ. And as we are chosen as the body of Christ, we are to live. There is a way of living that has already been done what? defined. The Bible says that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Very, very important. Look at chapter 2 of Ephesians. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. The former life before meeting Christ who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? That is how we used to be. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 makes or gives us the background in that you and I should do not forget how we were formed. First of all, when the Lord formed you and I, you that is listening, we were dead in trespasses and sins, which is one of the things that we all know how it came about using Romans chapter 5 and the verse is actually 12. It says, Therefore, just through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Thus, death spread to all men because all sinned. Rolling back in 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is the penalty of living in sin? Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Now, the other important thing that for, us we, we, that for us to consider is what Ephesians is showing us. That when we are dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says it even mentions how we used to walk by saying, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. There is a former pattern, but that former pattern should be succeeded by a new pattern that does not contradict the Bible doctrine of what? Justification and sanctification. 
And so it adds in to say, according to the prince of the power of air, that means we are not at liberty, the spirit who now worketh in sons of disobedience. Now the fact that we are not sons of disobedience, therefore we should be more attuned to the instruction of our Lord, no longer to live in the former mannerism, in the former pattern of disobedience, doing things that are contrary to the lives of those that have been now made alive. So that's the whole thing that the Bible makes so very much clear for us. It says in verses 4, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Look at the person we have been made alive together with. We are talking about Christ, the righteousness of God that has been revealed unto us, which is actually made clear to us in Christ. The Bible says that, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of grace in his kindness towards us in Christ. Now, Chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now I'm going to begin to teach. After giving a very brief introduction, knowing that 2 Corinthians 5 is a reality, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, that all the things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And equating it to verse 20, which says that now we are Christ's ambassadors unto all nations. We are a colony that has an original place where we come from. Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in heaven. So if we are here carrying out our ambassadorial ship work, the scripture makes it very clear in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, look here. We don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. The motive is different. Religion does the works to, in one or the other, gain acceptance from what it does or from what they do. But people who are believers, Christians, who are following after Christ, they do the good works because they are saved. Their good works is a response of their new nature. It is actually a spontaneous thing that comes as a result of, of the new nature we have. It says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, after having known that you are God's workmanship, created in Christ, However, do you know that you as a workmanship, there is particular works that have been prepared beforehand for you and I to walk in? That's where the issue of sanctification comes in. And this is the issue that the majority of the church folks have neglected. They don't care about this particular part. But justification and sanctification, they go hand in hand. Now, remember so very much well. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our redemption. There is no way you meet anything that is to do with redemption and then you don't find the issue of sanctification. There is no anywhere you meet righteousness and you don't meet anything to do with sanctification. They go hand in hand. Remember sanctification is actually a process. Sanctification is the outworking of the doctrine we have received. Now that we are God's workmanship who are created in Christ, how should we work out all of the things that have been worked in? That is why we are going to consider a number of important things right now. So, the scriptures are very clear. When you look at uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, if we may consider verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly and above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Look at 21. To him be glory in the church. Look at that. To him be glory in the church. 
The church glorifies Christ by working out the doctrine. The church glorifies Christ by living in sanctification, by living in holiness, by living in consecration, by living in a practice that does not underlook, does not underestimate the doctrine. To him be the glory in the church. No wonder the Lord makes it very clear by saying, we are the light of the world therefore we should let our light shine remember one thing here that bible says that christ is glorified in his church in all generations forever so we cannot talk about the issue of doctrine and then we forget the issue of sanctification and that is why we need to pay actually to put to bring a balance to all of these things that is why i was showing you something before i get to the ephesian which i want to central on so much it says for brethren you have been called unto liberty only use not your liberty for an occasion look at that use not your liberty for an occasion meaning that we should not use our liberty in endeavors that are to do with excitement. We should not use our liberty as a resource for us to live vile lives. And it adds in to say, as occasion to the flesh, but by love, serve one another. Now, let us look at Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we get to have so many things very well there. It begins by saying, here is where I want to center on for the rest of the minutes I have. It says, I therefore... I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, now we know that Paul was already in prison when he was writing this episode. And it's very important for us to know, he says, actually inside from the prison, beseech you. Remember the word beseech means what? It is the same word in Greek that means palakaleo, meaning I exhort you, I entreat you, I admonish you, I beg I strive to appease. In other words, it says that uh, I beg and I admonish you guys. Look at that. That you walk. Mark that one. That you walk. The walking here simply means that you progress. That you regulate yourself. You conduct yourself. Look at that. Regulate yourself. Conduct yourself. It doesn't to say that you regulate yourself worthy. The word worthy here, or that you walk worthy of your calling, is the same word that basically means to walk in a balanced way. Our lives should not contradict doctrine. And how do we know that? How do we know those that have not been given any doctrine? Those that have not been fed on sound doctrine? We see them even in the manner of practice. But how do we know those that have been fed on doctrine? Their practice shows the doctrine they have been fed on. Doctrine is also emulated in practice. As well as practice is a testimony to someone being taught. <sighs> My God. Worthy. Is a simple word that actually calls for a balance. Meaning that our lifestyle, our practice should not contradict the doctrine that we have been taught. We shouldn't walk imperfectly, not in a balance, but in a balance with a doctrine. There are many out that do not have the balance of doctrine and sanctification. They say that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But the question is, did they in one or the other come to a place considering the rest of the scripture in its context? Because the rest of the scripture is very clear, even if we may use some of these verses. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, and those people who set their minds on the things of the flesh, they think that they are super spiritual because there is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ. But they forget this. The Bible has to say, those who live according, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
That is why I, read, I told you from the start, justification goes hand in hand with sanctification. More to that is why the book of James is actually there as far as the New Testament is concerned. So, we should not exalt one truth at the expense of the other. There has to be a balance. It says, because, in verse 7, the carnal mind is emit against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Look at it. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What is our main theme? What is our main aim as believers? To glorify Christ in his church. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 21. How can you, how can you please the Lord when you are doing things that are contrary? It says in verses 9 that, uh, but you are not in the flesh, okay? Are you hearing? Doctrine actually empowers an individual to live a sanctified life. To live a sanctified life. Look at what he says. But you are not in the flesh. He came on from verses 1, building them slowly but surely. And he says there are those who are actually setting their minds on the carnal things. And such individuals cannot please God. But since I'm talking to you Christians, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. And if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not of his question is do you have the spirit of christ in you okay if you have the spirit of christ in you you will not set your mind on the things of the flesh and another thing that is very important look at 10 and if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness the spirit of christ in us craves after righteousness you cannot say that I have the spirit of Christ, but I do not live a sanctified life. I do not live a purified life. I do not live a consecrated life. I do not live actually in holiness. The righteousness is the root. The holiness is the fruit of righteousness. It has not to say in verses 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised him from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Look at verses 12. There are for brethren. Now, the sanctification part comes in. We are debtors known to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Look at 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, meaning you'll be separated from the life of God. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Because I am justified, I desire to live a sanctified life. This is why he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You cannot skip verses 12 and verses 14 and 13 and then you go to verses 14 by saying, For as many are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You're forgetting. Yes, that is very true. But are you living a life of sanctification? Very important things that are in the book of Romans, Ephesians, and Colossians. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 that I beseech you to walk worthy of your calling. To walk worthy of your calling. There is an invitation, a divine invitation that has been given unto us as far as the matter uh, of salvation is concerned. It says, wherewith you are called. There is a calling that God has called us to participate in. There is a calling that the Lord does not want any of us to walk in after we have now received his calling. There is a way. These are things that are being substantiated. Even in Ephesians 4, 17 says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you hence walk, mark that statement, hence walk our progress, our regulation, our conduct should do not contradict, should do not reduce on the doctrine. We should glorify Christ in his church by allowing our practice to align with what the scriptures teach. Says, walk not as other Gentiles, those that never had a covenant relationship with God. Do walk in the vanity of their minds. That is why Ephesians 5 2 says something very important. Walk, now mark that. 
There is what we call an order of importance. If something is repeated more than once, it basically means it's very important. The rest are also very important. But this one is very important. Walk in love. There is a way of life that a believer is supposed actually to emulate. That same word that is known as worthy is the same word that is repeated in Philippians 1.27. Say that, now let your conversation be as it becometh. In others, let your conversation be as it is worthy, which is the same thing as becometh. He says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and I see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in the spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. The one writing had a particular way of how he conducted himself. And that particular way of how he conducted himself is the same way he actually makes an admonition to the rest of those that will read this episode by saying there is a standard for believers. Our calling separates us from the former lifestyle. We are called from something to something else. It says, brethren, be ye followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. The apostles practice. Their way of life never contradicted what they taught. And that's why Paul said what he said there. And my dear ones, I need us to be well versed about this particular thing. When you look in the book of 1 Thessalonians 2 to 11, it says that you should walk worthy of God who has called you. We are now accountable to God. We are GIs. We are God's issues. If we are God's issue, therefore we are to glorify Christ in his church because it is him who purchased the church with his own blood. And if he purchased the church with his own blood, the mannerism of those that were purchased with, by his own blood should bring glory to him. This is not legalism. This is teaching the whole counsel of God's word. It says that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his, unto his kingdom and glory. The same is true when you look at the book of First Thessalonians 4. And it says, furthermore then we beseech you. Now, how many words of beseech? How many verses of beseech? We beseech you, brethren. Are you a brethren? Therefore, you tell us that you are justified by even how you do what you walk. Because if you cannot put value on what was done for you, therefore, if you do not see the value of what was done for you, we wonder whether you came to know Christ. Because the one who has met Christ, Ephesians 4, 17, 18 says that you have not learned of that. If there is any way that contradicts anything to do with Christ, he says that is not what you've learned of Christ. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, Furthermore, brethren, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk. That's the sanctification bit. He first taught them who they are and all of that that the Lord did for them. But after that, that justification is also seen in their sanctified lives. To walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. More to that, the verses to add and say, For you know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing that is very important is when you consider the book of Titus 2.10, it says that not purloining, but... Now, the word purloining here is the same Greek word which means to be set apart. It says not to embezzle, but showing all the good fidelity that they may adorn doctrine. Now, look at that. That they may adorn doctrine. We are to put things in order. We are to arrange ourselves in order. We are to live in a manner that does not bring blasphemy onto the doctrine. We are to do things that are honorable. We are to do things in one way or the other that make the doctrine very attractive. So, just like, you see, one thing that is very important here that, that you and I need to pay close attention to. It says, uh, if we may consider Titus 2.10. It says, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that you 
may adorn the doctrine of God and our Savior in all things. Now pay close attention to that, my dear ones. We adorn the doctrine of what? Our Savior. Doctrine, just like I began by saying, is just like our foundational garment. And our practice is the adorning, as in our practice makes doctrine attractive. We are to put in order our doctrine by how we live. That is to mean we are to live in a manner that adorns, that is very attractive to the doctrine. That the unbelievers themselves are able to say, yes, that person got something. That person is different. My dear ones, as we walk worthy of our calling, we live the way we live because we are called. And that is to mean our calling comes with a responsibility of living worthily and separate. We are called from a way of life to a different way of life. We live sanctified lives because we are called. And that is the whole theme of the book of Ephesians and everything. So this is why Peter the Apostle makes it so very much clear for you and I to pay close attention to what you are saying. We may consider 1 Peter chapter 2 and the verse is 9. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth. Now see that. That you should show forth, in other words, to declare abroad, to make known by praising or proclaiming or to celebrate that is the meaning of of showing forth the praise of him who called you remember what i have just mentioned that we are called from a way of life to a different way of life and remember what i said we live sanctified lives because we are called remember one thing that is very important just like good designers do avoid the clash of colors and size believers ought to avoid a clash of doctrine and practice hence we are to be balanced in doctrine and practice and that is why paul the apostle still made it very clear writing in the book of first corinthians something very important that we should not take for granted in first corinthians 6 9 it says do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived people do not consider the message of sanctification are the ones that might take lightly the statement of paul the apostle just like many of the corinthians would do the same thing of taking lightly this statement of the apostle that is why he says do not be deceived neither fornicators no idolaters no adulterers no homosexuals no sodomites no thieves no covetous no drunkards no revelers no extortioners will inherit the kingdom of god that is one thing that defines every person before he or she is called but the moment you are called verses 11 and such were some of you sanctification process but you what washed but you are you were what sanctified but you what justified in the name of the lord jesus christ my dear ones where there is the issue to do with justification there is an issue that is to do with sanctification i have told you and i'm saying it again here that just like good designers do avoid the clash of colors and size believers ought to avoid a clash of doctrine and practice meaning we are to be balanced both in doctrine and practice there is a clash when an old person puts on like a teenager that is why the apostle says here that and such were some of you so if you used to be like that in the past and then you go back to the very thing that you were washed from to the very thing that you were sanctified from that is the clash we are talking about you are like an elderly person that still craves to go back into the youthful age putting on in the manner of those that are still juveniles and the challenge today we have the juvenilization of christianity everything is all about seeker friendliness don't talk about my lifestyle that is now why you hear uh, lifestyle christianity i do whatever i want everything is all about seeker friendliness feel good thing is all that you hear i'm telling you 
Paul makes it clear by saying in verses 12 of 1 Corinthians 6, All things are lawful to me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The issue of sanctification is very, very important. Remember one thing also to the Hebrews. If you may remember very well, in the book of Hebrews, chapter if we may consider chapter 6 and the verse is actually 10. It says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name. They were taught how they had to labor in the Lord, in it that you have ministered unto the saints and do minister. Verses 11. Look at the admonition that actually talks so much on to how we need also to carry out our lives. It says, And we desire that each and every one of you show the same diligence to full assurance of hope until the end. That's the same thing, my dear ones. If there are those who are walking in a manner that is very attractive to the doctrine. If there are those whose practice makes the doctrine attractive, the apostle says, we desire that each and every one of you shows the same diligence to the full measure of the hope until the end. My dear ones, there is much to, to be said as far as these issues are concerned. Remember one thing. We live the way we live because we are called. And that is to mean our calling comes with the responsibility of living worthily and separate. We are called from a way of life to a different way of life. We live sanctified lives because we are called. And that is for you also to know that the owner of the family is in the hands of the child. How the child lives away from home actually means a lot. If the child has the bad characters, those characters are blamed onto parents. Therefore, let us glorify the Lord. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And everything that we do in these bodies of ours, remember what Peter the Apostle made very clear as far as verses, uh, verses uh, 9 of, uh, of First Peter chapter 2. It says, Show the praise of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 10, which in time past you were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which you against you. So look at the love. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they buy your good works, sanctification, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of his visitation. There is a lot to communicate as far as this issue is concerned. But I pray that there will be people that will understand this. That our way of living is very, very important. It's so very crucial. The calling we have as far as 2 Timothy 1, 9, it says, Who has called us and called us with a holy calling. Our calling is a calling that has something to do with holiness. You don't do the service of the devil and you think you are going to receive the reward of God. What a man soweth, that man reapeth. So let us be serious in how we live. Let us glorify Christ in his church by how we live. If indeed you are saying you are justified, there is enough doctrinal aspects, there is enough evidence from the teaching of the Bible how you and I are supposed to do what? Are supposed to walk. And that is why you all know so very much well that the Bible is so very much clear about some of the things when you look at the book of 1 John chapter 3 and the verse is uh, 3. It says that uh, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. There has to be a life of consecration. There has to be a life of practice that does not contradict the entire doctrine. Whoever of you that has been living in a manner that compromises the doctrine, it's high time you repent of that lifestyle and go back to the Bible truth and go back to the issue of considering doctrine actually in even your way of living. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.